Welcome, welcome. So welcome to our ELD, our monthly ELD meeting. Uh, Sherry Carlson and Jen Severance are away. So I am once again your primary facilitator and Beth's going to help me out. I get very nervous when I do these things. I know that's a strange thing to say. Um, but we have a very, very full agenda today. If you've had a moment to look over it, we've got uh, Anne is going to be guiding us through um, some research. And uh, then our my CDD colleagues, Emily Hazard and Carolyn Long, will be coming to talk about some of the changes in the CCFAP regulations slash requirements, and of course, what they're doing with CDDIS right now to try to get the testing all squared away. And then finally, Janet will, Janet McLaughlin, our deputy commissioner, will join us to talk about the workforce report. So if everybody could maybe just in the chat, do a little your name and with whom you are affiliated, that would be great. Let's see. I think we'll probably have a few more people. I was sending out the <laughs> agenda with the with the link. Welcome, welcome, Alyssa Alyssa Campbell Plus. <laughs> I loved the fluffy haired babies. I always thought they looked like baby birds. Like they would be, you know, I was an infant toddler caregiver. And so they, you're like, okay, they're baby birds. It just started to go down. It was a straight <laughs> mohawk for a solid three months. <laughs> it was really good. Yeah. My favorite. Well, great. I'm going to turn it over to Anna who will be um, talking about that survey that was included with the agenda and take it away, Anna. Thanks so much, Dawn. Um, good morning, it's great to see everybody. I'm Anna Brulette, I'm the Policy and Program Director at BBF. Joined my, by um, Kate Stubber at Child Trends will be presenting with me today. And we're also lucky to have a couple of other folks from Child Trends on the call who will be kind of supporting focus group or we're gonna do some breakout rooms to get feedback on the focus group protocol in a little bit. So we'll see some other friendly faces from Child Trends on the call with us today. Um, Kate, do you wanna launch the presentation for us? Do you want me to share, Kate? That would be great, Jen, if you can. Okay. And hi, everyone, we're excited to be here today. Okay, thank you, Jen. So um, we are first just going to share a couple of slides to kind of ground everybody in today's conversation before, like I said, we kind of get some feedback on specifically the provider focus group um, protocols that we sent around. We'll also try to put a link in the chat at some point um, for a, a version in Google Docs, Kate, I can share that in a little bit, um, in case folks did not have a chance to, or did not receive the focus group protocol we sent out ahead of time, um, or having a hard time finding it. So just to kick us off, uh, we are talking about, uh, our research partnership, um, and you can advance to the next slide, Jen. Okay, so um, as I said, going to start with just a little bit of grounding in the project itself um, and move through some feedback on the provider focus group protocol. Then we kind of love to get everyone's thoughts and feedback on um, some strategies for recruitment for the focus groups, which will be happening over the course of the summer. Um, and then we'll kind of briefly talk about next steps and our hopes to return to ELD um, as, as the research continues over the course of the next several years. Okay, so just briefly, um, the this research partnership is really a collaboration between myself and several other colleagues at BBF. Um, 
CDD. I don't know if uh, if our I know a lot of folks from CDD on the call. Or I'm not sure our, our data team folks are, but their names are on the slide. Um, they'll be sharing some really key administrative data to the child trends team as as they um, seek to better understand the impacts of the changes to CCFAP. Um, and then our team, of course, at Child Trends, really providing their uh, research expertise, both quantitative and qualitative. Okay, so really briefly, just want to ground uh, everyone in what the research is trying to better understand, which are both the policy changes associated with Act 76, um, as well as the policy changes uh, implemented in 2021 associated with CCFAP. So um, the over the course of the next several years, um, we will be uh, doing focus groups, which is our focus for today, um, but also some, some survey work. And as I said, some analysis of administrative data to better understand um, both kind of time periods um, and the impacts of policy changes related to CCFAP. So there will be a primary focus given the, the scale and, and recent uh, nature of Act 76, um, but we'll also be kind of considering some of the previous changes, particularly around the, the family share and its implications for affordability. Um, so we are kind of also thinking strategically about how the the... Uh, like staged nature of or the rollout of Act 76's policy changes. Um, so of course, don't expect to see impacts um, from, from things that haven't happened yet. As you all know, um, there's a big uh, or a smaller bump uh, in eligibility happening next month and then a really significant one happening next October. Um, so really just thinking about what when we anticipate seeing seeing changes associated with um, with some of the investments uh, and changes to CCFAP policy um, happening over the course of the next several months. Um, we wanted to just put this in. We also presented to the Families and Communities Committee last week. Um, so just kind of built in a purposeful pause uh, to see if anyone has uh, questions about the changes uh, to Act 76, um, the changes in Act 76 and changes to CCFAP. We know this group is, is really well versed, but just wanted to give room for any questions about, I guess, I guess either the, the research and its, its research questions or the recent policy changes. Okay, I'm not seeing any, but feel free to put things in the chat or come off mute. And I'm gonna hand things over to Kate for a little bit. Great, thanks, Anna. All right, so I'm gonna kind of share a little bit more about our research partnership, the project, and sort of what we're hoping to learn to kind of build on what Anna was just sharing. So as Anna noted, this is a three-year project and it's a research partnership between Child Trends, um, which is a nonprofit research and evaluation organization, Building Bright Futures, and Vermont's Child Development Division. The purpose of this project is to evaluate how the policy changes to CCFAP that Anna just talked about have impacted equitable access to childcare across Vermont. This project will look at administrative data from childcare programs and conduct surveys and focus groups with parents and childcare providers to learn more about the impacts of these changes. Our work will have a focus on providers and families in rural areas, families that are more recent, that are recent immigrants, and families with infants and toddlers. Through surveys and focus groups with parents and providers, we will learn about how the policies were implemented, as well as how these policies have influenced access to high quality care. Over the next two years, our project will be um, very much informed by ongoing feedback from families and providers, like through this committee. Um, and so we're gonna use the feedback that we hear from all of you and that we've already gotten from some families to shape every aspect of our work at multiple stages. Next slide, please. So um, in that vein, we just wanna note that we're really, really grateful to all of you and to all of your feedback that we're excited to hear today. Um, your feedback on our work is essential and we appreciate it greatly. And we're, we're very appreciative of you taking time to join this meeting today to share your input. 
Um, as I mentioned, we're hoping to get ongoing feedback from both families and providers throughout our project. Our plan is to join this committee meeting two to three times per year to get input and feedback on different aspects of our study, including our data collection tools like today, for example, for the focus group protocols. We also want to get input on and feedback on our strategies to recruit providers to participate in our focus groups and surveys. And we also will really look forward to your feedback and input on helping us understand and interpret what we're learning in our, in the, our findings as well as helping us think about how to share what we're learning back with families and providers across Vermont. Um, just a, one quick note that, and I alluded to this, we joined the families and committee communities meeting last week and got similar feedback from them on the parents and, and uh, caregivers focus group protocol. So we are well underway getting feedback and we're very grateful. All right, next slide, please. So here's a high level timeline for our project, which uh, should give you all a high a sense of sort of where we are and where we're going. Last year, we had a separate planning grant to prepare for this project, which included a parent survey, a survey of childcare providers, and an analysis of administrative data. Now in 2024, we will do some focus groups with parents and parents and caregivers, as well as early care and education providers. We will also do some additional analyses of administrative data. Then in 2025, we will conduct surveys with parents and caregivers and a survey of providers. We will do another round of administrative data analyses. And then in our third and final year, 2026, we will um, do another round of focus groups with both parents and providers. We will do some key informant interviews. Um, and we will also do an additional round or a final round of administrative data analyses. Next slide, please. So a little bit more information about these focus groups with providers. So as you all know, we're hoping to get some feedback from you all today on our protocol. Um, and that just means those are the questions that we would hope to ask a group of providers in a focus group setting. Um, our plan is to have five focus groups this summer with around a total of 40 childcare providers who participate in CCFAP. So based on providers' needs and preferences, we will do a mix of both virtual and in-person focus groups that will last about 60 minutes each. Um, focus group participants will all receive a $50 electronic gift card as a thank you for their time um, and participation. So on this next slide, this is just a very high level summary of some of the research questions that we're hoping to answer through talking to providers. So we're interested in how providers are learning about the new reimbursement rates, co-payment structure, family share structure and capacity payments. We want to hear more from providers about their experiences with and willingness to participate in CCFAP and how their experiences have um, changed after the new, with if, if and how their experiences have changed after the new policy changes. We're also interested in hearing how providers are experiencing the reimbursement rate changes and capacity payments. Um, have they experienced any unintended consequences as a result of those? And lastly, we are interested in learning from providers how the reimbursement rate increases have helped to cover the costs of staff compensation, staff wages, benefits, et cetera. So that's a high level view of sort of what we're hoping to learn through these focus group questions that we're gonna to discuss today. So next, I guess I'll pause here. Does anyone have any questions about our project or what we're hoping to learn or the focus groups? more generally before we dive into actual feedback on the focus group protocols. Yes, I see a hand raised, go ahead. Um, I Looking at your timeline for mm -hmm. when you're doing the focus groups and starting this in 24, can you tell me when roughly you're thinking that that will be? The focus groups will be in the summer, this summer. So I'm just wondering because there will not be full implementation. And, and so to this point, um, you know, there's continuous change. And it, honestly, it's super difficult as a program owner and a person who creates a budget every year mm -hmm. to um, predict what these increases mean, particularly mm -hmm. the one that is going to be happening in October and what that yep. will mean for families, um, you know, I and who's gonna qualify and who's not gonna qualify. And so it's very difficult to create a budget around that. And so I'm just a little concerned, like how somebody might feel. <laughs> I, I just, 
I'm wondering about the timing of when focus groups start. Um, are they are they kind of an ongoing thing where you're going to hear continued feedback, or is it sort of a one time thing? Because how I'm feeling right now, or what the struggles are that I may or may not be having mm -hmm. right now, um, I've probably got more anxiety about <laughs> not knowing which of my families that currently don't um, actually qualify will qualify. Um, so I, I, I don't know. It's just feeling a little, the, the timing is feeling like it would be nice if we could get through that period so that people really knew what this full implication was and then really knew the answers to those questions you had after that. Like, yeah. I would be hard pressed to fully answer what full implementation looks like for my of folks course, yeah. until, does that make yeah. sense? No, I appreciate that. Um, and I think I should, or I think those research questions that I just had on the screen are for our whole three-year project. So I think that's sort of why we're taking a phased approach. We'll do the focus groups this summer. Mm -hmm. Next year, we'll do a survey. So we'll, we'll have three different time points, one each year, where we'll be able to get uh, feedback from both families and providers. Oh, with, okay. So, so that because we're fully, we're so yeah. aware of exactly what you're describing that like okay. as this rolls out and as new, new sort of parts of the policies get implemented, folks experiences are going to change. And that is completely understandable and, and really a big part of what we're hoping to hear from you all about. So I think um, they won't be rolling per se, but we will have three different time points where we'll be collecting data from providers as well as families on this. So I think all of your current experiences and hesitation and questions are all things that we would really want to hear about in those focus groups from providers if, if folks are feeling similar. So thank you for sharing that. Does that answer your question? Yep, thank you. Wonderful. Um, okay, Cynthia, I see your hand. Hi, Kate, thanks. I'm curious, uh, and maybe this was um, captured with the Families and Communities uh, Committee, instead of this committee, because this is really focused on providers. But I'm curious in the big scheme of this project, will there be any data analysis looking at what the gaps are? If I recall correctly, um, there was originally language around refugee um, immigrant undocumented families. And Vermont's system of CCFAP does not attend to family, friend, and neighbor care. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we know like from an equity perspective, I think kind of looking also if there's a way to look at that gap and who CCFAP is not serving and why uh, mm -hmm. could be really telling. So I'm just curious if this project could or might incorporate kind of that missing sector who's not receiving CCFAP um, and why, and especially around family, friend, and neighbor care. Absolutely. It's a great question. And yes, we are hoping to, this is something that we presented to the Families and Communities Group on, but happy to share an update here. We will be doing um, five focus groups with families, two or three, or excuse me, three or four groups with families who do participate in CCFAP, and one or two with family, one or two focus groups with families who do not for that exact reason. I think we're very interested in sort of some of the barriers that folks are experiencing or reasons why they may have not been able to access CCFAP or may not realize they're eligible, um, among many other reasons. So we will definitely be doing that. And I think if folks have, um, we're gonna talk about this at the end, but we will certainly be coming back to this group as well as families and communities to kind of get your thoughts on how do we best reach folks? Like how we're, we're gonna help, we're gonna obviously rely on you all or, or turn to you all for some support around how do we make sure we're um, recruiting in a way that that include, that include that reaches the families that you were just describing. So I think um, that, is definitely on our radar and we will be doing, um, since it's related or could be related to folks who are recent immigrants to Vermont or to the United States, we will be doing at least one focus group in another language um, or in a language other than English. And we are going to, our, when we recruit for those focus groups, we will ask, we will have our like sort of screener survey translated into at least a few different languages. And then we will sort of, based on how many people indicate a need for a, lang a particular language, we will be able to offer at least one in another language, which we hope will help reach some of the um, communities that you're describing. Awesome, thanks. Great questions. Any other questions? 
Mm -hmm. I, I had put a couple mm -hmm. questions in the chat. I didn't know if. Um, yeah. It's like Anna. Let's see. Anna to one. And yes, we'll be um, that absolutely. We would we'll love to hear your thoughts on sort of how to recruit those providers. Um, and we'll and then yep. Sorry, yep. you go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to read for you so you didn't have to scroll through the chat. Um, well, any of the questions that you're going to be asking the providers or the families um, involve how the funds have supported high quality practices within those programs? Yeah, so I am scrolling through. I think this would be a great thing to talk about. Um, if, if you feel like it's not sort of called out enough in the provider focus group protocol, that's something we could certainly expand on more. And it is, an ex to an extent, the way that we're asking parents about quality, just since you don't have access to that protocol, um, uh, is sort of helping, we're getting an assessment of sort of how they're, if they're currently in care, the extent to which their current care arrangements align with their needs and preferences, including things like whether the care they're receiving is aligned with their cultural values is you know, so we're sort of trying to get at quality in a way that um, is maybe more in terms that parents might relate to or um, sort of understand. So we are, it is something that we're touching on, but I think we'd be, we'd be open to your feedback if you feel like it needs to be a, a bigger sort of emphasis in the provider protocol for sure. And Amy, just to piggyback on that, another portion of this project, hi, I'm Sarah, also from Caltrans, part of this project. Um, um, we'll be looking at administrative data where we will be looking at some indicators of quality um, as available in like the QRIS system. Um, so we're trying to get at quality in a few different ways, just acknowledging that, you know, there are certainly a lot of strengths as Kate was talking around, really the family perspective, um, but knowing that there are other data out there as well that we're going to harness to try to understand the um, these questions from different perspectives. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks for the question, Amy. Anything else? This is great. Um, anything else before we take a few minutes to review the protocol independently and then break up into some, some breakout groups? Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, we're gonna give everyone just a few minutes in case you um, didn't have a chance to look at the protocol before the call, which is not a problem, of course. Um, we'll give people about a few minutes to look at that on their own. Um, and Anna just put it in the chat. Thank you, Anna. So if you need a Google Doc version of it, feel free to um, take a look at the chat. Um, these are the questions that will sort of be guiding our breakout room discussions today. So we're interested in hearing from you all what's missing from these protocols. What else should we be asking providers about? Is there any language that we that you all think is confusing or unclear? Any jargon we need to clarify or remove? Um, are there questions or topics in the protocol that providers might not feel comfortable talking about in a group setting? Um, suggestions for how we could improve those? And then of course, any other feedback or comments about the protocol or the focus groups overall. So um, yeah, so I will pause there. We'll leave these questions up on the screen for right now. Anna is going to be dividing us up into breakout groups. So. We will just give everyone a few minutes to review the protocol on their own. And then um, there a, a box in a few minutes will pop up to say, join a particular breakout group. And then you can just go ahead and click that and join. Any questions? Awesome.
All right, folks, I'm going to open the breakout rooms. Um, as always, this can this can get a little dicey. So just let us know if you have any trouble getting into your room and we'll help you out. Okay, Beth, I'm going to join my room. Are you able to stay in the main room in case we have folks? I saw a sign pop up, but then it disappeared. Okay. Look at the bottom of your screen, maybe, under breakout rooms. It should say join breakout room. Hold on. I moved it to a different... Oh, I see. It's still stuck over here. I got it. Thank you. Awesome. And, and what time am I bringing people back together? Um, once we have extra time, I would say 1050 would be great. Sure. Thank you, Beth. Everyone is back. Anna, do you want to close this out? And folks, folks, in my group were like mid sentence. <laughs> oh no! Well, uh, yes, we had a really great conversation in, in my breakout room as well, and I ended by saying we'll make sure that everyone has my email and Kate's email uh, to send along any any feedback that you didn't get a chance to share. Um, and we we would welcome that. So please, please reach out. Um, Kate, do you want to wrap us up? And I know we wanted to talk a little bit about focus group uh, recruitment strategies. That would be great. Jen, would you mind putting the slides back up real quick? Not at all. And while she's doing that, I will say I mentioned this in my breakout group, um, but please feel free if you think of additional feedback or have more specific kind of line item, line edit feedback about any of the questions, please feel free to send Anna or myself an email with the document with any of your edits or comments or additional feedback that you didn't have time to share today or that you think of down the road. Um, all right, so let's go to, yes, focus group recruitment. So we um, we only have, I know, five minutes before, so we, we don't have much time to, to think about this, um, but unfortunately, but we will come back, I think, um, to this meeting, hopefully, if there's time in the agenda to talk more about recruitment. Um, but if anyone has any ideas about recruitment and sort of what we should be considering or thinking about as we start to brainstorm how we'll recruit providers for these groups, recruitment strategies that folks think will work particularly well um, or won't work well, um, where we could advertise for these, if, um, and maybe just folks could be thinking about this um, and put it in the chat um, because we are definitely interested in sort of we're getting started on thinking about how we'll recruit these providers. Um, and as a reminder, we will be conducting five groups with about 40 different providers who participate in CCFAP. So um, that's sort of the scope of what we're looking to recruit. And we're obviously hoping to get a mix of folks who are in centers or home-based care, um, you know, from all over the state. So we're hoping to recruit as diverse of a sample of providers that really reflect the different experiences that folks may be having. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything that is at the top of their mind they want to share before we go to our last slide. 
I'll just say in, in, in breakout two, we did talk a little bit about recruitment and program types that would be in different um, focus groups, whether they would be all center-based or all family-based. And I, without having spoken to the rest of the child trends and building bright futures team shared that we like we probably would offer um, sessions in the day and evening mm -hmm. and the feedback at least in um, our breakout room was that it would be helpful um, with interpreting the data having groups that were center-based all center-based and having groups that were all family child care providers great that's helpful yes claire i think i'll add again i had said this in the focus group, but I think it will be important to make sure you're reaching out to providers that currently participate and receive CCFAP and ones that don't and engaging the child care providers that do not um, engage in CCFAP and to uh, probe a little bit as to why and um, do these changes incentivize them for now taking children that are on CCFAP. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so, and so so we make sure we don't cut into um, the next person's time. We just want to, again, say a huge thank you to all of you. Um, we do, as I think Anna mentioned or Beth mentioned when, when they sent out the information about joining this group, for everyone who's joining today in their role of, as a child care provider, um, we have an electronic gift card that we're able to send to all of you as a thank you for your time, as we know that you're incredibly busy folks and you took time out of your day um, to join us. So to uh, be able to receive that electronic gift card, I need everyone to just click on the link that I just put in the chat. It's a three question survey that just asks you your name, your email address, and whether you would prefer a gift card from um, Amazon, Walmart, or Hannaford, Hannaford's. Um, you can tell I'm not from Vermont, I'm from North Carolina. So um, sorry about that. Uh, so yes, so please click on, if people just want to take a quick second to fill that out, um, we'll make sure that that gets sent out to you all after the fact too, if you don't have a chance to fill it out today during the meeting. Um, and then we'll be sending out those gift cards to folks, to the email address that you put in there. We'll email those out to you hopefully next week. Um, and hopefully we'll see you all again soon this, um, later this spring or early summer to talk about focus group recruitment. Um, and again, a huge thank you. Here's our email addresses. I know Anna put them in the chat. Um, I'm going to stay on the call and listen to the rest of the call. So if people have questions, you feel free to like message me directly in the chat. I'm happy to answer any other questions as well. So um, thanks, everyone. And just don't forget to fill out if you're a child care provider, please, please, please fill out that survey. Um, it should just take like 15 seconds. So we make sure we can um, send you your gift card. Well, thank you, Kate, Jennifer, Sage. I think I got all of the Child Trends team. Um, I'm really excited for this uh, information and data. I think it'll, it certainly, it certainly insights that CDD is always interested in as we, as we think about our outreach to families and how we can support providers of every um, designation or or situation across Vermont. You know, it was funny when we were talking, I thought, yeah, there's no straight way to get much of anywhere. <laughs> you have to kind of move up and to the side and to the left or to the right. So it is, it is a while it's a small state, it's a geographically challenging state. Feel, as you know, you're reaching out to Carolyn and Chris, and we're always happy to provide what we can and have access to um, in our, oh, I'm seeing Emily, I'm seeing the other CDD folks joining. So uh, Emily, do you see Carolyn? I haven't seen her pop on yet. I don't think so, not yet. Okay. Oh, and there she is. So without further ado, I am going to be, uh, I'm going to introduce Emily Hazard, who's our child care uh, benefits administrator and Carolyn Long, who is our uh, director of operations at the child development division to talk about some of the up care, upcoming changes in um, CCFAP. 
Yeah, hi everybody. Um, thanks for having us. Um, Emily and I will kind of be tag teaming and um, happy to answer questions um, as we go through this. And Emily, please jump in at any time um, as you see fit. So uh, yeah, we were just here to uh, talk about the changes that are coming up and kind of our communications and outreach strategy to um, Vermonters. So we are super excited that April 7th, we will be doing three major changes um, to the CCFAP program. Um, that was from the Act 76 from last July. It was passed in June and acted in July. Um, the first being updating the federal poverty guidelines to the new 2024 um, rates. Um, the second one is to um, increase our eligibility up to 400% of the poverty level. And then the third is getting rid of the $25 family share amount um, and, it, and uh, the $0 family share going up to 175%. So super excited. We anticipate um, more families being eligible for the program um, by that extra 50% of the poverty level. Um, and then um, in um, July, I'm sorry, in October, we will be increasing that to 575% of the federal poverty level. So that will be the big change that we're kind of anticipating a lot of applications and folks um, applying and becoming eligible. Um, so to just talk about a little bit about our communication strategy and outreach to folks is that we are excited that we actually do have a dedicated communications person in um, CDD now. Um, her name is Nicole Barnes. Um, she's been with us a few months, so she's still getting her feet wet, um, but she has hit the ground running for sure. So she's definitely already helped us in a lot of ways um, in our messaging, in our kind of our style of writing for plain language, um, which is very exciting. So for this round of um, changes, we are anticipating, um, we did a front porch forum last month for February. We're, we'll be doing another one again for um, March, um, just as a reminder for the changes. We also will be sending out um, a communication through our blog and our social media. We'll be targeting our providers and parents of the changes, our current CCFAP families and parents of the specific change um, and kind of some content instructional things that they'll need to do and look for as these changes go into place. Um, we're also gonna be doing a press release um, so you'll see that coming out. And we're also looking to like target some larger employers um, such as the state of Vermont, right? So we're gonna um, be sending out um, a message through our like human resources um, newsletter that we receive that as state employees, also looking at like the University of Vermont, um, their whole network kind of targeting them. Um, and then actually looking you know, out to you folks to help us get that message out as well. One other exciting piece that we won't have in place for these changes, but we will be doing, we are gonna be contracting with a, a like a, a marketing agency. Uh, we have to go through a whole process here at the state to kind of get that going um, and get permission. So we are in the process of doing that um, to have kind of like a master marketing contract agreement where we'll be able to do um, much bigger, better social media um, web, mm -hmm like um, outreach, you know, TV, radio, um, like we're gonna get the full gamut. They call it the full access master marketing um, contract. So we are really excited about that. I am hoping that we'll have that in place for the October changes, but it's not only necessarily for like just the big changes, right? It's just, just constantly encourage families to apply and, re and get that reminder out there that they could be eligible. So. Um, here's some of the parameters, you know, try to apply, et cetera, et cetera. So um, those are, it's very exciting. We have such good staff here at the state that are working their tails off to get all of this stuff implemented and um, all the beside, behind the scenes work that goes into all this. So a big shout out to them um, for the work that they're doing with all these changes. So I know we have 40 minutes and my, I knew I wasn't going to have a whole, like a 40 minute speech to give, but we were happy to um, hear your feedback, get your thoughts, suggestions, questions. Um, we're happy to help answer those. So 
I don't really know how this works. I don't know, do I pass it back to you, Don, or just take questions as they come? Yeah, I think we're just gonna take questions. It looks like Cynthia has a question. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Carolyn. I'm curious in the messaging, Carolyn. I'm, I work with um, a variety of programs on, on nutrition security and nutrition access, and but I've had a lot of conversations with many programs that even communicating about why families would want to apply for CCFAP, um, especially if they're in, you know, not going to receive a, a big kickback for themselves, they're not understanding potentially the impact for programs and what programs might then be able to offer um, in support of kind of this, this combo package of funding. And so I, my question is, will some of the messaging that you have for families not just be targeted to how this supports them, but how this supports programs? Um, because that was a lever that in working with one early childhood program, she's like, oh, I hadn't thought about we might be able to offer, you know, snacks now because of sort of increased funding if everybody applied. Um, so I don't know. I was just trying to think of what are those dual messages? Yes, it's good for families if they apply, but it's also good for programs and programs can be thinking flexibly, right, about better mm -hmm. wages, better compensation. And, and so I feel like I don't know. I just think I wonder about sort of that two pronged approach for families who might not receive such a, a, a robust um, CC VAP payment, but it still helps the program um, and just creating sort of that community centered approach to messaging. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's yeah. No, that makes total sense to me. It's like the trickle down effect, right? Like of something that. You know, I always think of like the three squares program, like every dollar spent in three squares money is like three dollars into the economy. Right. So it's kind of like you may get a small subsidy, but like the trickle down effect of how it supports providers and the rest of the community is, is much bigger as well. So we had we don't have that part of our strategy right now, but I absolutely think like with um, our new communication specialist and like our marketing strategies, we could definitely incorporate something like that into it might be just like a fact information sheet of some sort, like um, just kind of, yeah. But thank you, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Um, I guess I, I wanna kind of figure out how to say this, but um, I feel like the messaging to um, parents like destigmatizing, um, a lot of times there's a misconception around childcare financial assistance, and that it's for a specific demographic of um, persons, which of course it's not. But um, just in terms of a thoughtful approach that um, can um, have this like um, Real open, gay, open, inviting, destigmatizing messaging around um, the ideally, right? We want as many as families as possible to access this support, and to it's. We know it's not universal; it's not close to universality. But um, I would just love to um, Again, just try and destigmatize this program specifically being only for low income families and have it have negative um, implications that perceived. Thanks. Yeah, no, great, great, Claire. Um, I think you're right, especially as we grow the income eligibility to to five hundred seventy five percent. And I, I think we could like, I, I actually have thought about that a little bit, but look to some of our, um, our fellow divisions and colleagues, you know about you know, the whole welfare concept in general of it's just like, if you receive a benefit of any sort, it's like a bad thing, right? Or you're, you're like, you're getting help from the government and you should be, you know, stabilizing yourself. So I, I definitely agree with you and hear, with you, hear you on that. Um, again, hoping like Nicole can help us with some, some clever marketing and outreach to help to, to get rid of that stigma. So thank you. Within within my programs and my families, <laughs> the um the the forms for CCFAP are part of their enrollment, which they have to redo every September. So they ex accept it as paperwork. And when I come up against that from a family, and I've heard it many times, um, what I say is it's not a subsidy; it's a Vermont employee benefit. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, great way to kind of set to think of it differently. Yeah, it's it's the it's the subsidy word, so we need to to yeah. immediately stop using that word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Tanya. Yeah, um, I really like that, Christina. That's a really nice way of putting that. And um, I've just been uh, putting, you know, as every change comes about or is about to, we put out information. And the way I've been couching it is like, you know, um, the concept behind the whole child care bill to begin with was to create a system where nobody really pays more than 10% of their household income, right? That it's publicly um, funded and invested in such as public school so that it is yeah. meant to be accessible to all. Um, so please <laughs> apply, right? Like here, so every time it's come, I'm like, here's the forms again, here's how you, <laughs> here's who to contact, um, you know, at the family center, this kind of thing, um, you know, and, you know, it just jump. it's about to jump again, you know, here's, you know, here's the percentages, here's the income guidelines, see if you, you know, see us if you need help. So that's how I've been couching it. And it does seem to help because we've had a lot of inquiries. Yeah, that's great, Sonia. Thank you for sharing that. I think the, the only other, well, like two other thoughts I'm having, um, same thread, one is, one isn't, but like a lot of times also people think around the same lines where it needs to be somehow justified, like thinking about from like a, a perspective and some people don't want to take from somebody that might need it more or, you know, that whole, um, I hear a lot like that from parents. So there's got it and, and, um, they're like, oh no, it's not meant for me, somebody else. There's people out there that need it more. Just something like there's enough. I don't want to sound weird, but like there's an abundant, there's enough, like just that mentality. Like this is okay. This is for you. You don't have to look or feel a certain way in your family's economic situation. If you qualify, then it's for you, you know? Um, so identification so that people can identify with this more personally and that it's okay and you're not there's not someone else going without because you're accessing it and then the other thought totally different vein and I apologize if you said this already but I'm also curious around the implementation of the enrollment based invoicing as opposed to attendance based and I know that you guys are juggling a lot of um levers around implementation but I was just curious about um the status of when that might be um implemented thanks so much yeah, sure. So we are um, planning to implement that um, for uh, 6.30 of 2024, June 30th. Um, it so it co coincides with our state fiscal year, which is how the policy, um, uh, how it works. So yes, we have um, drafted a policy and um, Emily, do you, would you be able to prepare to kind of speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, I think um, a memo, I believe a memo went out about um, what we were proposing for the enrollment-based payments. So um, looking to combine child absences into one category and increase the number of child absences to 30 um, per fiscal year, um, but with both provider and child absences um, having the ability uh, to make exceptions to go over the the cap if there are uh, exceptional circumstances. Um, yeah, I think that's yes, yes. Thank you, Beth. That's the, um, the link to the the memo that CDD put out a couple weeks ago. Um, just where we are at with with enrollment based payments. Does that help, Claire? Claire Freeze on you folks too. Yeah. Yes. 
So thoughts, questions, suggestions. I can just add in too, um, the community child care support agencies have been kept updated as we're preparing to roll out all of these changes. Um, so just that they've been kept in the loop and that they're you know, just a reminder that they're a really great resource. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions, Emily, is like, who else is involved? Like, clearly there's going to be some oh, big yeah. commercial <laughs> outreach, which I think is great. Um, but if you can give a sense of who else is involved and are there, like, there are certainly targeted populations that will need My, different types of outreach. Um, and I assume that's happening at a, at a regional level, but um, if people wanted to be able to, you know, promote those messages, how do they do it? Yeah. So because all of the, the April 7th changes, um, are impacting both families who are not currently receiving CCFAP and then families who are currently receiving CCFAP. So for families who would have a change to their eligibility as a result of um, the change to the 2024 FPLs and the elimination of the $25 family share, so all families below 175% FPL will have a $0 family share. Um, so families who are currently receiving CCFAP are going to receive a communication that that outlines um, what they what they should expect. And they may or may not see a change in their eligibility, but uh, that will be communicated to them. Um, so who else who else is involved? Is that your question, Beth? Yeah, it's, I, you know, I I know that you're working with the regional child care, you know, regional organizations in terms of outreach and just what information, if information will be going out in a way that those of us who also have statewide networks can be promoting those, but also thinking about targeted populations, like when changes go into effect around eligibility for um, non-citizens um, or, you know, non-English speakers, like what's the strategy around those particular populations? Yeah, so the um, non-citizen, uh, the expansion for children who don't meet the current eligibility requirement for citizenship or immigration status. We have been consulting with numerous organizations around um, our development for that change. Um, so we've been working with DIVA, um, Migrant Justice. Um, Carolyn, definitely feel free to jump in. Um, we're consulting with a lot of different organizations um, in developing that proposal. But then I think in terms of our our outreach, we'll also be looping those organizations back in when, when we have a policy that we're <laughs> able to share um, and we have more information on the, the actual implementation of those changes. Um, yeah, and then as Carolyn was saying, we're working on uh, having another front porch forum post for this month and then um, just getting information out larger employers uh, through this network. Do you have anything to add to that, Carolyn? Yeah, you no, know, I mean, just that we are still working on the citizenship um, policy and definitely taking into the accounts the barriers that they face in terms of just getting the message to them, not only along with applying once we have our policy. So there's so many aspects of, of this that we're trying to um, figure out now. Um, and by contacting partners and organizations like from um, Department for Vermont Health Access, who actually already has a policy in place and um, is uh, supporting um, non-citizens, we we were looking to them to see kind of how they structured, how they did it. Um, there's a lot of things around data and what we can collect and what we can't. And so um, actively working on that now. Around yeah, um, I have a couple questions. Can you remind me, um, somebody, you were just talking about the non-citizen piece. When, do we have a date on when that comes into effect? Um, we are 
hoping for seven one. I I don't okay. know if we'll have we'll have all the policy together. Um, all of this has to go through rulemaking too. So um, it is a bit of a challenge. We're trying to as soon as possible is is what we're thinking. Um, that is not set in stone, but that is a target that we're hoping to to make. Um, along with the seven one changes, we do have an increase to the family child care home providers as well, so that they will not there won't be a more than a difference of fifty percent between them and registered home uh, provider rates. That will be going to affect. Um, uh, it's actually really June thirtieth, uh, the start of the service period um, for that one as well. Okay. And, and the then, enrollment the enrollment policy will go into place then as well, 6.30. Okay, and can you, that was one of my questions. What what does that look like? The, like from the back end of not, you know, putting in attendance and all that, like what does that kind of look like, um, the enrollment based? Like the number, the from actually putting in attendance, is that what you're like yeah. to know? Would you put in attendance? Would, um, would you still be putting in attendance? And if so, what might that look like? Yeah, we are still requiring attendance um, because it serves purposes for multiple reasons. It's for some of the data integrity that we're required to have for our federal partners. Um, it will allow us to keep track of the number of days. A, because we are we do have a 30 day limit and we can extend that. But B, it's also to see if like people do go over that amount, right? Like how can we make this better? We have the, we will have the opportunity to look at this and study the data. And if we find, you know, in six months to a year that we need to actually tweak it a little bit more, we can. So um, looking to have that data um, in, ter in terms of collection so, attendance as well. Okay. So that might be one piece of communication. If we're still going to be putting in attendance and it's going to pretty much look the way it does now, uh, probably there will need to be some very intentional okay. communication yes. <laughs> around yeah. they look the same, but from the back end, it's operating differently. Just, you know. Absolutely. We have not, I'm going to be very frank with you. We have not even gotten to the piece of communication for June 30th just yet. Oh, gonna, I, bet. I know, I know. We're going to, um, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to cross over this April 7th deadline and then we're going to go right into the 630 stuff. So absolutely appreciate your thought, but just know that we, we haven't really sent anything out, so thank goodness we haven't forgotten anything yet. But we re we appreciate that. And one just final in the, thing, in the, I just wanted to add in the chat there is a link to the um, enrollment based payments memo uh, that CDD has shared, and that does mention we're aiming for June thirtieth as a target, and then does outline some of uh, what we're proposing or what we're planning on making for changes. So that has a, a good amount of information. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, also wondering, um, obviously, we're about to go to the 400%, as you just mentioned, and then we're going to be bumping in October again up to that, that final bump. Um, is there a way to get the state rates like as much ahead of time for that as possible? Because I think that really helps at least me in communicating with all of my families, if you can show the eligibility and the state rates together, um, that's super helpful for communicating and outreaching. And it's also helpful for me in planning. So I know that you guys had a survey like idea, like a template, which we've got, and we've, you know, you can tweak to your own needs so that we could potentially put that out with some of that other information and we could actually probably better budget for the fall. Yes, we plan on releasing those like within the next couple of months, like kind of after the four, the, the four, seven changes. Yeah. And then we will release the, I think you're talking about the income guidelines up to 575 in the, in the copay or the family share amount. Is and, that, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It, the, if we could have what, Right, the income guidelines and the what the rates are going to be that goes with those percentages would be fantastic. Yes, absolutely. As soon as possible. <laughs> I understand <laughs> you guys, you know, you're doing a great job with that. That's um, but I think just I know everybody's like planning budgets for next year. So this is like one of those quick turnarounds, unfortunately, for us that are are crucial to proper budgeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Any other questions about the upcoming changes or suggestions for um, our communication? Who is wonderful, Nicole? <laughs> who is wonderful and she gets deluged by all of us with all of our ideas, but it's great to hear suggestions. I think it's also really helpful for people to hear kind of what the implications are, like what 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 each, each of us, whether it's at CDD or, you know, uh, people who are running family childcare or center-based programs, like, what are we navigating right now and where does the information come in? I, I think that that is helpful to be able to hold kind of the whole system and and know kind of what's the transition, what's the information that people need and where, where is the support? Um, as well as for this committee to think about like what information might be helpful to be shared or discussed here um, or brought out to other, other groups. Wow. Carolyn this morning was like, I don't have, <laughs> it's not going to be very long. Like, I said, I'm sure <laughs> that there'll be questions. I have no <laughs> doubt. We, we, we value the feedback and questions because it only makes, makes us stronger and better and being able to serve Vermonters um, the way that we want to. So thank you. And I really loved the suggestion about framing this as a, a Vermont employee benefit. I mean, that's without saying this is where we're taking the tax from, <laughs> but that's where we're taking the tax from to, to help support this. So yeah, this is a parental leave. I mean, this is part of the benefit of being a Vermonter. Certainly not every state is getting this kind of influx of support by their legislature and citizens. Is there any uh, plans to either hold an informational or or record an informational and send out talking points so other programs and families can, well, not the families, but the programs can talk to the families and, and maybe information to the families more along the line. Like if we're hearing things, for example, one of my families panicked when they saw that the rate increase went up and they thought oh my god we couldn't we could barely handle it now and now that they're, they're saying more you know we we have to figure out a way to not put him in care and i had to you know navigate my way through that and saying no just because the state is is re, you know is uh contributing more towards child care doesn't mean that your rate is necessarily you know i i whatever it was individual to that family but 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 it didn't affect her. But her way of looking at it, they already had a conversation. They were done. One of them was quitting work and that was the end of it because they couldn't afford it. So if there's, you know, even if it's on your your website or or somewhere where they can go for form, something where where there's like little little things in quotes or something that they could go, oh, it, it is okay for me. Yeah. That's a great, yeah, great suggestion. Like again, like a toolkit or some sort of like for you for providers. Um to have kind of, like you said, talking points information. Um, no, that's that's great. Thanks, Christina. Last call for thoughts and questions. Don, I know we have a little transition time. I don't know if we want to take um, updates or Sure. Anyway, just a suggestion while yeah. we're um, looking for Janet. Well, I was going to give a brief 
update on readiness payments um, since we're transitioning. But I wanted to thank Carolyn and Emily for stopping in and sharing the Act 76 updates. I think uh, Sonia said, yes, you guys. You are collectively all rolling with lots of changes every mm -hmm. every month, and it's very exciting here. Never a dull moment in the child development division, but it's important work, and we're excited to be doing it. And we thank Carolyn and Emily for doing a lot of the behind-the-scenes testing of CDDIS and getting that as smooth as possible. Well, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. And thank you all for your work. We, you know, it's a collaborative group effort and uh, we, we're very appreciative. So thanks so much. And please feel free to reach out with suggestions and thoughts. We're happy to, happy to have them. So thank you all. Thank you. So I'll just, I'll start with a, a we'll, you know, uh, some space for some updates before Janet joins us at 11, <laughs> I think 11.45, 40. Sorry, I don't have my agenda up in front of me, but uh, the governor signed the Budget Adjustment Act yesterday. So um, we did receive an additional million dollars back from the workforce uh, the workforce bonus which will go into the final round of readiness we're going to be sending out new award letters to providers very shortly i had a meeting this morning about the addition of that stream of money into the remaining stream of, of what we have left from uh, the 20 million we have about uh, we have about close to $3 million left, not quite. It's actually, actually it's about two and a half million dollars left. So that 1 million is going to give everyone a full final payment at the rates that they're being, the monthly rates that they're receiving now. And then they're, we're going to split the rest of that maybe 500,000 into a per rate, a per child rate and simply add on um, to everyone's final payment, a small amount, but there's a communication going out discussing the, the final payment. There will be no payment in March because we just received this funding, but there will be a final payment in April. So if you, we are also trying to get the word out that um, this program is coming to an end, sadly. We know how wonderful it's been for um, all providers to be receiving or providers who qualified to be receiving this money. I will tell you that I know that there are many providers who believe that this money is going to be ongoing because I've been fielding some of those questions asking about, well, this is going until at least the end of the year, right? And I have to say, oh, heavens, no. Uh, so if you can get the word out, uh, if you hear that, information that we've got one more, at least one full more or full payment left. So there'll be a, there will be two communications. One will come out from child development division's main mailing list. The other individual letters are going to come from Eliza who is managing the individual payment spreadsheet. So she's going to do personalized and we're going to have a general go out to everyone. We were just waiting until yesterday for the budget amendment. I didn't want to promise money we didn't have. That seemed unwise. And then just to give you a very, oh, was there a question? Yeah, um, I actually heard somebody announce on one of my meetings I was on the other day that they were doing another round of readiness grants. Okay. Not exactly. Okay. No, there will. Th so this will be the final payment. The next big project that we're working on is the quality and capacity incentive program. Those will not be readiness payments. Those are going to be linked around stars and supporting um, the um, renewal and application and leveling up of STARS. We're actually in the design phase right now, so I don't have 
anything solid to share about that quite yet because quite literally there is a grid that we're all filling in right now about possible ideas and sequencing of that. So it will not look like readiness payments. Um, it will be much more focused around the support of STARS and some kind of financial support given the feedback that we've had regarding why am I doing this? I'm not getting a higher rate. Rose. Hi. Hi, Don. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the that last readiness payment. I'm just curious if um somebody that's become registered, a newly registered individual since the beginning of February, you know, there was kind of like we I was encouraging people if they were becoming new in the field to apply for it. So what about that last um, payment? Is this something that um, somebody new could possibly benefit from or? Sadly, no. no. We closed okay. the applications on February 9th and, and okay. it, that the door has closed, I'm afraid. That's, that's okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I knew. Thank you. Yeah. Unfortunately. Listen, if I could give out $20 million every six months for the rest of my life, I would do it happily. <laughs> there will be a survey link that comes with that final um, award, the final official award letter um, that asks people to take a very quick survey. It, it looks a lot like the ARPA survey. You know, did you, how did you use this? Did you increase, you know, it, it'll be following actually the, the readiness application very closely. And then there's, there will be a, a, a line that says, would you be willing to be interviewed? I'd like us to do a percentage of interviews either on Zoom or through the phone with providers to talk about their experiences and um, hear their suggestions. But there will also be a text box that says, please share any stories that you um, have about the way these funds impacted your business. Uh, because I'd like some of that qualitative data to go with the quantitative data of sort of the yes, no <laughs> binary. I'm a, I'm a qualitative gal, so I wanna hear the stories. Rose, did you have another question or is your hand? No, 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 don't. I do it all the time. <laughs> Will there be a, a blurb or a paragraph in the final um, agreement letter or or how we're getting the, the, that last payment that says, you know, other funds have been infused in the system. So, you know, you're all you're going to be getting more money possibly in X date or X date so that people don't go. Oh, the money's gone and go into a panic. They know that that rates are changing or anything like that. That's a great suggestion, Christina. We hadn't built that into the, you know, the award letter. It looks like that sort of. You got it. <laughs> generic award letter yeah. with, you know, we're going to have a link. But I, I do I do appreciate the idea that there needs to be sort of a yes, this has this is sunset, but. Here is the sunrise of the rate change in these other uh, programs to let folks know, because I think you're right. There is going to be some, um, I hope not panic, but at least a little bit of a startle that this check anxiety. that has been coming in. Yeah, anxiety. <laughs> anxiety, perfect, <laughs> yes, yes. So, well, I'm afraid I took up the whole update time. <laughs> and I see Janet has joined us, so I don't want you know I don't want to cut from Janet's time. So, Janet, uh, Deputy Commissioner Janet McLaughlin of the um, Child Development Division is here to talk to us. Oh, you're in your office. We could have used the same room. And we, none of us never know, ever know who's actually here until we see the backgrounds and go. Oh, you're actually somewhere in these other rooms. <laughs> so welcome, Janet, to talk about the workforce information. Great. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. 
Um, glad to be here. Um, and I am uh, I'm excited to get the updates on the things you guys have already talked about before I arrived. Um, and so I am here to um, talk about the um, workforce reports that were recently released um, related to um, sort of as a package, actually, in, in January, we released um, three separate workforce reports related, one related to children integrated services reports, one related to the um, Head Start workforce, um, and another related to the regulated childcare workforce. So that's both, um, and that's across the lic all license types. So um, registered family childcare, licensed family childcare, the um, after school programs and center based child care. And um, I, in this quick amount of time, right, we're not going to be up, have a chance to get like too deep into it to this, but I'm happy to give you a little tour of sort of the information that is available um, and what some of um, our initial takeaways were looking at the information. It is a long report. I think as a, we need to look at the <laughs> value of creating it as a long report versus just giving some folks some tables. To, um, to do some research to, to look into. Um, and part of the reason, and one of the reasons for that is because this is kind of a long report. This is also old data. This is from December 31st, 2022. So it is not, this data is, this is from a time period over a year ago. Um, but I still think there's some interesting things to look, to take a look at um, uh, overall. But so we're, um, so let me share this with you. I'm gonna give you just, um, I'm gonna use uh, presenter's privilege just to show you a couple of things that take you as we go. Um, so let me see, I'm gonna share my screen and here it is, I think. Okay, and then I can make you guys bigger so I can see all of you as much as possible. Um, okay. So I just wanna make sure you people know how to get to this report. If you need it, we can send you the link, but just for, you know, your everybody's support in the future. Um, you know, we do have, you know, this is our, right, our CDD page. You know, if you use the sidebar, there's a reports and publications section right on the sidebar. And then you can see a bunch of different, you know, reports and resources that CDD offers. Um, we did recently hire uh, our first sort of full-time person to manage communications for the division. Nicole, she's fantastic. And uh, sort of updating, reorganizing this section is something that is on her to-do list. Um, so this will get even better and easier to navigate. But for now, just so you guys know it's here in terms of some of the resources um, that you might use. Um, but if we get down... Um, uh, a little bit further, this is where the workforce reports are. Um, so you can sort of see here that the January 2024, there were several, This we released sort of a package of reports. I'm gonna talk about specifically about the um, early childhood and after school professionals workforce report. Um, but I did wanna just sh show you while we're here. Again, we're going to reorganize this, but this one at the end is kind of interesting now. It's a new a new thing we've added related to capacity and regulated program totals. Um, and so I'm just going to click to it real quick. So we've got, um, for people who are interested in capacity type numbers, and this is the direction we're hoping to head. I'm sharing with you guys because I wanted to let you guys know this is the direction we're hoping to head with some of our data sharing. Um, so for example, here's total regulated childcare capacity, but if you click on positive, it shows you the um, the trends over time. Um, and then we have it, you can see we have it broken out by different program types, um, by different ages and totals and stuff. So I just wanted to share that with you guys that like our hope in the future is we're heading in this direction in terms of the data accessibility. Um, so it may mean there's a little bit more um, interpretation needing to be done by folks using the data. Um, but it also, um, I'm hopeful that it'll allow us to be able to share information more quickly um, rather than feeling like we need to get it into a 72 page, you know, really well formatted report. <laughs> so um, that, so here, here it is. And um, I am going to just walk you through some key pieces of it uh, within this report. And sorry, it's on my screen over here. So I keep looking over here. Um, so 
just getting through the table of contents um to the first um uh to the first part of it it does have information on the data that is included in the report it, you know again it's people who are working within regulated child care programs and who are in positions that mostly positions that have direct care and supervisor responsibility for children it's not all the like every single like affiliated party in every single way but the people that really are are tied in um and have a specific role typically people have like a really specific role called out in licensing um so um and again, this is coming out of our Bright Futures information system, and people, um, many of you guys have much longer experience with that than I do, but it is, um, has been around for a long time, which means uh, it does, it's not the most flexible system. So some of the data, there's a lot of data we wish we would have that we do not have, or data that's in there that's really difficult for us to pull out and analyze. Um, you know, there's a future in which we will be able to do that, but it is, we are in the present. So um, in terms of this report, some just some key hot, key pieces of data that are in here at the highest level um, was looking at individuals, actual individuals who are working in childcare um, overall. And so again, they, we tried to compare 2018, 2020, and 2022 uh, as much as we can uh, in the report. Um, and, you know, thinking that, right, like, 2018 is right. Obviously, it was pre-COVID. 2020 was a COVID year of data, and then um, 2022 um, was when programs were starting to get back to normal operations. Um, and so, right. So we can see small increase in the number of people working, but not back to the 2018 levels. And then for a lot of the data within this report, it then breaks out those figures by program type. Um, so people can take a look at it. And so what we can see is that we have a decline in after school and in family child care homes. Um, but there is a, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a significant increase in um, mm, those labels aren't right. Dang it. <laughs> it's center face. This, this is after school. I'm going to do it. This is after school. These labels on the bottom, right? This is after school. This is center base. This is family childcare homes. Okay, sorry. Labels on page twelve. Okay, um, the um, so anyway, so you can see again what for after school. It's a little tricky because there. I think that there are a number of places where because there was a lot of money through agency of education, there might just be few. There may there may be fewer regulated after school spaces, but there might actually be more after school spaces like in the world and thus people working in those programs in the world. They're just not in our data set. Um, family child care, this, uh, this obviously does reflect the trend that, that, you know, the nationwide trend in terms of the reduction of family child care homes that we also see in Vermont. And it's very much tied to demographics um, in terms of, right, people are retiring from being family child care providers and they're not being new family child care programs have not been entering the market. The hope is that we're going with the changes as a result of X76, we can turn the curve on that. And then for center-based though, we are seeing, I understand that there, we have like huge workforce issues, but at least the trend isn't like down again, right? The trend at least in this was up a little bit. So it's not, so it's not, um, uh, even when it feels like it's falling off a cliff, the data is not showing that <laughs> for now. And um, and then it's got all this stuff by positions, by um, the numbers by positions and um, it broken out by program type. So I think this is really interesting stuff. It's tricky for people to, we don't have enough time to go in there, but I want you guys to know that it's here. Um, you definitely do see, uh, you know, a decrease in the number of in people who have that teacher qualification. Um, uh, right in this data, it was showing teacher associate as flat. Those are the two groups that are right qualified to lead groups of children, which is really um, we know is really important. So that's something to look at there. Um, I'm just going to keep scrolling because I want you guys to know what else is in this report. But so that those kinds of in, that kind of information is available across all program types as you need it. 
Um, and we are at the PPD meeting on Tuesday, going to be talking about this. That sorry, right? The um, Professional Preparation Development Committee meeting. We'll be talking about this on Tuesday for a longer period of time. If people want to go to that meeting as well, um, so I'm going to squeeze past all of this. Then we also analyze things by region, so you can also look by region um, uh, to you know to get a sense of what's happening in your specific region. And abs, the data does vary by region, so that's definitely like one of my key takeaways is that you really see the trends are um, specific to read, you know, are specific to regions, not, and it's not, um, so that's um, to look at. So again, we see some AHS districts that have like rebounded in terms of the number of staff that they've had are hiring since 2022, that they have in place since 2022. And we see some that have continued to decline. So you can, you can see, right, this variation, right, of Brattleboro back up 10%, but um, St. Albans down 7.3%. So um, then I wanted, we also have data in here on education and credentials. Um, and I uh, wanted to share, so I see, I'm sorry. What I wanna say is it's really amazing. It's really great because we have a lot more folks with credentials. Um, that have been verified that are in the system, um, which we, means we can trust this data um, more than we could before. So we have, um, so you can see this really significant increase in the percentage of individuals that have that information. That is a result of, I know, a work, you know, like a concerted effort uh, by a number of you on this call. Um, and just flagging for folks that haven't heard, right, we have with the additional ARPA money that we have right now, um, we have um, increased um, the availability of bonuses for people who have um, earned, uh, when people are, for people to, when they earn a level of credential or increase their level of credential. So it used to be that you had to have all your training within two years. Uh, your training needs to have been within two years of you submitting that application, but now you can go ahead and submit and, it, and, um, and receive the bonus. Um, without that two-year limit. Um, and that's a, that's a temporary thing, again, and that is, again, about us. One, we want to get money in the hands of people that have invested in earning their credentials and getting it in there, but also we want the data. <laughs> we want to have a better sense, so we really want to encourage people to get in there. So we want, um, so thanks to everybody who's been spreading the word around, around that as well. Um, but you can see the data is better than it used to be, so that's excellent. Um, and then when you look at degree attainment, we are seeing a really significant increase in the number of people within the field who have reported um, the higher um, degrees, associate's degree or higher. Um, so it is um, in the degree categories, it's up each degree of the degree categories is up by at least 42% since 2018. So we were just, we are seeing more people that have told us that they have degrees working in the field. Um, we still, right now, but but when you look at the analysis, it is 32% of the individuals report an associate's degree or higher. Um, and we know that this includes substitutes, right? It includes trainees, right? Like it's, so I don't, I think the number should be higher than 32%, but I don't know what exactly it should be, right? Because we are always are gonna have people that are entering the field, so. Um, but something to, I think it's useful information for us to consider as we get down here. Sorry, I didn't have the right part of the chart showing to show you that we have right to 465 at the associate's degrees. Bachelor's degrees went from 1,000 to 1,500. Um, you know, master's degrees seeing an increase, you know, a significant increase there too. So I think that that, you know, is a positive story for us to tell that there are people that really are interested that are earning these degrees and are interested in, do, in working within regulated childcare settings, which can be early childhood education or after school programs. Um, uh, this is showing, there's a lot of detail in the concentration, which I think is kind of interesting. And then um, I also think people could spend a lot of time looking at this chart around um, the looking at the degree or credential and the person's role in licensing. It's not a perfect one-to-one, -one, right, of like related to like what the licensing qualifications were and exactly what the things are on the left, 
but it's a good, um, it's an interesting proxy for us to look at to try to understand um, the workforce better. And then this, we have information again, broken down by district to sort of see which, um, you know, where the, where if there's other certain places we need to focus on getting more credentials, having people submit their credentials uh, and, um, then, so yeah, so this is all sort of broken. And then it's, this is after school programs. Sorry, I'm gonna make people, I don't wanna give anybody motion sickness, but family childcare programs um, in center-based, it's broken out there. And then at the very end of this, it has a little, it has a couple pages for each, um, or more than a couple pages. It has four pages for each um, region for them to understand sort of what the, you know, specifics were in their region and and, to, and see how that met, data can be useful on a, in a community level. Um, and then I wanted just to return quickly to my, um, to the conclusion, um, which, you know, we talked about a little bit internally. Um, I, and the, um, uh, you know, made, just made some key points of saying, right, there was a small increase in the number of people working in regulated childcare programs you know, our thinking is this probably points to the importance of the child care stabilization program and the workforce retention bonuses and um, uh, payments. Um, this is this. There's another point where I'm making here where we're where we're saying we do see an in where I'm pointing out like the difference by setting right and the fact that we need to, and then um, so we see an increase in center based pro in people working in center based programs, but a decrease in in family child care and after school. And also pointing out that difference by region, um, and so that this, you know, making just the point that this means that we really need to look at um, program types and regions when we're developing strategies for capacity, for qualifications, for, um, uh, you know, for career development programs. Um, I, you know, the other point point that we saw right is that we did see that. Um, right, just more people are working within right, more people working in regular childcare programs do have degrees, which probably means that more of them have loans, <laughs> which points to the fact the value of things like the um, uh, the student loan repayment assistance program. Um, hopefully, it points to the fact that the, some of the difference that the TEACH program has been making over the years. Um, it points to you know the some of the the importance of some of the efforts that we've made or in terms of um, supporting really clear pathways for people to move from their, you know, to move from their AA to the BA. Um, and um, and then I also, this might be in a different part of it, but another piece that I, I saw was interesting was because we are seeing both an increase in people that have their degrees and an increase in train, like a significant increase in people that are trainees or aid level, right? So have very low, you know, low qualifications as we um, see in the data, you know, which is not the perfect representation of reality. And so like given that divide, we really need to make sure those folks that have the higher levels of qualifications are really, you know, have that mentoring and like pedagogical leadership and leadership skills that they need to support those staff that don't have as much training. And obviously we wanna help bring those staff people into, into um, uh, some of the more formal education programs as well, um, but making sure that those staff really feel really comfortable leading their classroom team um, feels like an important, um, something for us to consider as we're thinking about the professional development strategies and work that we wanna invest in. So that was a real fast walk through that. And like you said, it's 72 pages, so I'm sure there's there's so much more to get into about it. But, and I know it's 59, so. <laughs> so I'll just dance my way out now, right? Okay, sorry. <laughs> With our minute, does anyone have questions? <laughs> Like I said, we're gonna talk more about this at the Professional Preparation and Development Committee meeting. I really appreciate any effort that you guys have if you guys are engaged on the regional level. So maybe bring the regional data to your um, 
uh, you know, to your BBF regional committee or to your regional directors group, you know, things like that, that might be helpful. Um, and then I'm hopeful that it'll be helpful for all of us as we're thinking about sort of workforce development programming. Um, Thank you, Janet. Um, yeah, this concludes our March ELD meeting. This yeah, is great. Thanks, so. We'll see you next month. Yeah.